Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode here on the SITREP Podcast. For today's content, we're going to be taking our second swing at a military historical film review. Our first review like this was on the classic film The Battle of Britain, which was pretty well received by the community, so that's encouraged me to take a second try at this. So like I said in that review, um, a couple of things. We're going to be sticking mostly, at least at first, with positive movie reviews. Honestly, it's just a little bit more fun that way. Secondly, we're going to be reviewing only the film's military historical accuracy. I didn't go to film school. I'm not trying to critique anyone's acting, cinematography, or direction, anything like that. Third, um, we're a wargaming channel, so I'm going to be putting, where I can, a wargamer's focus on this material. We're going to be taking a look at what you can draw from these films in terms of your list construction, your terrain, your table builds, your unit research, your historical research, things like that. So with all of that out of the way, what are we reviewing? Another nearly perfect classic, the opening of Oliver Stone's Vietnam trilogy in the movie that spawned pretty much an entire generation of Vietnam War films and maybe helped America just a little come to terms with its Vietnam experience. I'm talking about the Academy Award-winning classic, Platoon. Okay, so as many of you may know, Platoon is Oliver Stone's semi-autobiographical account of his experiences in the Vietnam War. Like our protagonist, Chris Taylor, played by a young Charlie Sheen, Stone was a college dropout who served with the 25th U.S. Infantry from late 1967 into early 68. Stone would also serve with the 1st Cavalry, be wounded twice, win the Bronze Star, so he's definitely the genuine article. Accordingly, Platoon has often been lauded, and justifiably so, as a fantastically realistic account made by someone who was actually there. And that's exactly where you should start to raise some eyebrows. While that visceral first-hand texture is certainly a credit to the film, objectivity is just not going to be possible. And any kind of broader context is going to be an issue because an infantryman in combat knows next to nothing about the larger picture around them. Platoon admirably sidesteps the second issue by how it frames its material and under the helmet portrait of a U.S. Army platoon in Vietnam. But the objectivity is something we're going to have to keep an eye on. The main unit in the movie is the 25th Infantry Division, often known as Tropic Lightning. It's mentioned, albeit incompletely, in a screen caption near the beginning of the film. The division is also clearly identified in the shoulder flashes you see, depicting the Hawaiian taro leaf and lightning bolt in scarlet and yellow, the colors of Hawaiian royalty. The division was originally formed at Schofield Barracks, Hawaii, just before the attack on Pearl Harbor, and fought all across the Solomon Islands in the Pacific War. In fact, you can see them in another great war film, The Thin Red Line. Later in 1944 and 45, the 25th fought across jungle battles all through Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines. They were also one of the first divisions to respond in Korea, finishing the war with 14 Medals of Honor. They had troops in Vietnam as early as 1963, with a full engineer battalion by 65, and were engaged in brigade strength by 66. By the time we get to 67, when the film begins, we're looking at the 25th Infantry more or less permanently engaged in the South Vietnamese backcountry extending 45 miles northwest of Saigon, through what was called the Iron Triangle, and into the Binh Lan and Tay Ninh provinces in what was then called War Zone C, right up against the Cambodian border. So in summary, 25th Infantry was not lightly chosen for this movie. Since its formation, it's been specialized as America's Asia Pacific Jungle Warfare Response Force. The division was involved in Vietnam more or less from the start, their soldiers winning 21 more Medals of Honor. And as we've said, this is the division in which Oliver Stone put in the majority of his service. Opening at what is probably Tan Sanot Airport in Saigon, we see the cargo tail open on an Air Force C-130 Hercules transport. Range on these birds is about 2,000 miles, so they may have flown in from the Philippines, a common staging point from where many U.S. servicemen would enter Vietnam into places like Tan Sanot, Da Nang, or Cam Ranh Bay. We meet our main character, a freshly minted private Chris Taylor, and some other so-called cherries. You hear some other soldiers talk about a certain number of days on a wake-up. This is a theme that's going to continue through the film. This is soldiers counting down how long they have left in their field tours. In Vietnam, most soldiers were expected to serve a tour of about 13 months, with some of that being devoted to acclimation and in-country training. Usually this would round out to about a solid year in the field. 
So if it was October 1st and you were due to rotate back to the world on October 10th, you'd be 10 days short or have nine days in a wake up. Looking forward to shipping out on that 10th day. So we cut to aerial footage over Triple Canopy Jungle and this caption you see along the bottom. This is a very important slice of writing if you're reviewing the historical precision of this movie. Bravo Company 25th Infantry, that's all we're given. This is Stone leaving himself plenty of wiggle room in regard to pinpoint details. Note he gives the company and the division, but conspicuously leaves out the battalion, regiment, or brigade. By leaving out these middle echelons, he can put his characters when and where he wants to without too much concern for direct historical timelines. This is also because the account is semi-autobiographical and he has some very nasty things to say about the US Army in Vietnam, so he's not directly throwing anyone he knows under the bus by name and he's not replacing any real veterans with his fictional characters. Now a lot of attention has been focused on the idea that the last big battle in this movie is a dramatic recreation of the real life battle of Soy Cut, or fire support base Burt, on the night of 1-2 January 1968, an engagement in which Stone actively participated. That would put us in 3rd Brigade, either with 3rd or 2nd Battalion 22nd Infantry Mechanized, the so-called Triple Deuce, the problem we hear is that the 2nd of the 22nd was a mechanized infantry battalion with M113 APCs, which we don't see in most of the movie. The other Bravo company at Soycut was with 3rd Battalion of 22nd Infantry Regiment, a better fit in terms of equipment and organization, but now we have another problem where one of the characters in the film later references, quote, 3rd Battalion just got hit 15 clicks north of here, meaning that our movie platoon can't be part of a 3rd Battalion. Also, the Battle of Soycut in general doesn't really line up because of issues with the dates that are mentioned in the movie or specific enemy units that are mentioned, or the fact that the platoon fights NVA troops throughout the movie instead of the Viet Cong that we saw historically. But again, none of this really matters because a day-by-day -day recreation of the campaign was not Stone's objective. These are fictitious characters portrayed against a historical backdrop. This is not Band of Brothers in Vietnam. In a broad view, 25th Infantry was in War Zone C, right up against the Cambodian War second half of 67 and the first half of 68 so this is all correct in a general sense but this is a historical film review and i just want to let you guys know if you drill down into the weeds on this there are some issues with what unit this actually is what battles and ops they're being portrayed who they're actually fighting these are vagaries which again i think stone left in by design so we have the platoon pushing through some dense hilly jungle this movie was filmed in Luzon in the Philippines. Interestingly, this is the same island that the Tropic Lightning Division fought through near the end of World War II in real life. But this is pretty much the terrain that you would see in War Zone C. We're way back from the Vietnamese coast, so there's plenty of hills and elevation next to zero urban or agricultural development. So yeah, this is the back end of the bush to be sure. The only issue, and man, this is a tiny one, is the officer and NCO carbines that we see with Staff Sergeant Barnes, Sergeant Elias, and Lieutenant Wolf. In the movie, they are Colt model 653P carbines, which are not correct. These were not used in Vietnam. These are standing in for XM177E1 or E2 carbines, which were often issued or, quote, acquired by senior NCOs and junior officers. They were probably unavailable for the movie shoot as they are really rare. The rest of the weapons we see in the movie are pretty spot on. The platoon carries a mix of M16 and M16A1s, you can most readily tell by the lack of a forward assist on the original M16. The film features plenty of old school M60 machine guns, not so affectionately called the pig. So again, the movie does by and large a great job with the firearms depicted. We also see the punishing effects of the Southeast Asia climate on people who aren't yet acclimated to it. Little details to notice here are the platoon medic telling Taylor not to drink water in order to avoid cramps. I think ideas about dehydration in the field were a little different back then. I mean, I'm pretty sure this was still the period where they were giving people salt tabs of all things. We take a quick cut to a forward camp where we hear people yelling about unloading that 81 ammo. This is the ammo for the M29 81mm mortar deployed by section or battery back in battalion. This is the kind of mortars that would be off board in your games, usually with a range of about 5 kilometers. There's some footage of the platoon going through its routines, establishing a fortified perimeter, preparing weapons, field hygiene, with a voiceover by Taylor detailing the grooming routine. This is all great stuff and sets the stage for the experiences of a typical platoon on the typical ops in late 67 and early 68. And for this scene, I don't have any problem. The issue only comes later in the movie when this becomes a not-so-typical platoon. 
For purposes of the narrative, we'll find that this platoon is actually very bad. We'll get into specifics as we go. Suffice it to say that this is where some people, including Vietnam veterans, do have issues with this movie. Which is ironic, since this movie's claim to authenticity is that it was made by a Vietnam veteran. But I think Stone was making a few points here, and again, I think this is why he's left the precise brigade, regiment, and battalion of our platoon a little vague. So if you're creating a Vietnam campaign, particularly one with a narrative focus, yes, platoon shows some very real problems that were very widespread in Vietnam, just not usually concentrated into a single unit, and certainly not to this degree. Next, we have an orders group where we meet the leadership of this platoon. In command is Lieutenant Wolf, who is brutally eclipsed by the far more competent platoon sergeant, Staff Sergeant Barnes, played by my man Tom Berenger. Beneath him are three squad leaders, Sergeants Elias, O'Neill, and Warren. Now, each of these men commands one of the squads that makes up the platoon, so it's usually an eight or nine men in a squad, times three squads in a platoon, plus a small command element with a platoon leader, a platoon sergeant, along with a couple of RTOs, radio telephone operators. But the force on your table can be far less than this 30 or 40 strong total. These platoons, especially American platoons in Vietnam, were always chronically under strength due to casualties, leave, and constant rotations at the end of soldiers' tours of duty. This is also where we see the true power dynamic of the platoon, which is way out of whack. Like I said, combat soldiers served a tour of duty lasting about a year, but an officer would only be in the field for about six months of that time. So platoons were constantly losing officers and getting new ones, who were tragically inexperienced. Veteran platoon sergeants were supposed to advise and support these officers, but Barnes here is constantly undermining and usurping the lieutenant's authority. Wolf's personal, moral, and leadership weakness only worsens the problem. This is absolutely not how any platoon is supposed to work, and just the beginning of what makes this an unusually problematic platoon. So that night, some of the platoon heads out on what is called ambush. Because of American dominance of the air, the Viet Cong and NVA would have to move almost exclusively at night. The idea of ambush was to interdict enemy freedom of movement in the jungle, either by hitting him as he moved along suspected routes of transit, or by posing the threat of said interdiction. Interestingly, this is also where we see Sergeant Elias, Taylor's squad leader, show some proper leadership by taking extra moments to give practical field advice and direction to the new men in his squad. While new U.S. Army soldiers did undergo basic training back in the States, they arrived in Vietnam woefully unprepared for the specific conditions and enemies that they would face here in country. This is the ultimate learn or die experience, and solid NCOs could make all the difference. In your Vietnam games, try to include mechanics for troop quality, experience, and morale, and do not have them be unit-based. All units had good men and terrible men simply because, again, of this constant rotation. Now, here we do get the typical movie son of soldiers advancing in silhouetted file along elevated terrain. Real soldiers really try not to do this. It's a fast way to attract the sniper fire. This is just a movie shtick to get the dramatic shot. We get to our first firefight in the movie where Taylor is trying to set off his M18A1 Claymore anti-personnel mines. The blasts on film look like kind of normal explosions. Normally, a Claymore explosion looks a little more sideways. The Claymore is a directional shape charge, exploding mostly in a deliberate vector with 700 or so metal balls embedded in the charge for maximum anti-personnel effect. On your tables, no one should be too close to an exploding Claymore without taking damage, but their area of effect should be directional, not a simple circle. We don't see much of the enemy in the firefight, which of course is highly accurate. What we do see, however, clearly identifies them as NVA regulars, or more precisely, the People's Army of Vietnam. This is slightly unusual. War Zone C was predominantly run by the Viet Cong, or more precisely, the NLF, or the National Liberation Front. Especially since this was so close to Kosovo, the central office for South Vietnam. This is the primary NLF command structure, which was located just across the border in Cambodia. But I'm sure NVA units did operate through this area as well. It's just that this movie shows us NVA pretty much the whole way through, which is a little odd. To the movie's credit, we do see the enemy is not carrying the AK-47 or the AKM assault rifle, but Norinco Type 56s. This is a Chinese manufacturer or kind of a knockoff of the AKM classic. One of the platoon's characters is also carrying a Remington 870 pump shotgun, normally a police weapon, but useful in close quarters jungle fighting. 
This is where we also get the first fatality in the platoon, the hapless private gardener. This is sadly accurate. A wildly disproportionate number of casualties were suffered among men just starting their tours of duty. As Elias laments after the end of the scene, the man would still be alive if he had a few more days to lose him. Cut to base camp, which, given where and when we are, is probably taken in. The characters again compare and lament how short they may or may not be, and how many days they have left in their field tours. This is also where we delve into drug use by the characters, and where the movie catches some flag for over-portraying this problem. But drug abuse was definitely a thing in Vietnam. Over half of U.S. troops at least smoked marijuana, up to a third used heavier drugs like mushrooms, acid, mescaline, and about a quarter may have used cocaine or heroin. I don't really have a problem with this scene. Drug use was much less frequent when actually out on ops, and these men are in base camp. So if they were going to do it, and a lot of people did, it would probably be here. The only issue I have here is Sergeant Elias outright encouraging drug use among his men. But as we'll see, the officers and NCOs in this movie aren't exactly teaching a master class in military leadership. Back in the field, then we get a hard date on the timeline, New Year's Day, 1968. Now, the historical analog to the big battle at the end of the film takes place in just about 18 hours, and yet we still have about two-thirds of the movie to go. So clearly the action sequence at the end is not a direct representation of the historical battle of Sui Cut, as many have suggested, which in turn makes it hard to nail down exactly what unit our movie platoon is in. But again, I think Stone kept this vague by design to leave himself some narrative elbow room. In his voiceover, Taylor mentions, quote, a lot of NVA regiments moving across the border. Now this is a great little detail. As we know today, the Tet Offensive would begin in less than a month, uh, 30 January 1968 and both NVA and VC communists were building up for this attack for months. So just a small touch of uh, great foreshadowing here. You run across a communist bunker position, extremely well hidden. Now this might present an issue for your tables. Miniature gaming is all about showing off what you have and Vietnam was all about staying hidden. So there's a bit of a contradiction there. There are also some booby traps, which sadly takes out two more members of our platoon. So make sure that any Vietnam game you have has some kind of booby trap mechanic. We also see tunnels featured here, something you do not see everywhere in Vietnam, but Warzone C was a place where you would see them. So just one more of the countless things that this film gets right. A third member of the platoon disappears and is later found brutally murdered, which sets up the infamous scene at the village. Here, terrified and enraged, and presented with clear evidence that the village is supporting the enemy, American soldiers go way out of control, and we see scenes of civilian abuse, murder, even an attempted gang sexual assault. It's, it's not the most pleasant, uh, to put it lightly. All the while sergeants and officers stand helplessly by. Now, I'm sorry to say that things like this did happen, but they were thankfully not the norm. And again, clashes with the idea that this film portrays the typical experiences of a typical platoon. Again, this is a bad platoon suffering from terrible leadership. Even when his top two sergeants begin an outright brawl in front of him, itself an unforgivable court-martial lapse of discipline, the incompetent, quote, platoon leader stands there like a stick of wood. Again, Elias underscores the thrust of the scene when he almost sadly screams at Wolf, Lieutenant, why the f didn't you do something? What follows is perhaps the movie's most typical Vietnam firefight scene, especially in terms of war gaming tables. Two men are hit, including one of the platoon squad leaders. Much of the battle revolves around getting those men off the field, emphasizing the need for casualty evacuation rules for the Americans in your Vietnam games. We have mentions of what the other platoons in Bravo Company were doing, and the use of off-board artillery, almost certainly the aforementioned 81 millimeter mortar battery back at Battalion. Now, we do see King, played by Keith David, firing what are clearly blank rounds out of his pig, but again, these are tiny nitpicks. We also hear a lot of people mention enemy RPGs. Well, technically, these are B-40s, again, Chinese knockoffs of, a, of an RPG, which the movie does show correctly. This is an in-the-movie mistake that the characters are making, not a fault in the film itself. We also see Staff Sergeant Barnes in his element, briefly at his best, highlighting his fearlessness, decisiveness, tactical reactions, and leadership. He stabilizes the situation, lifts and adjusts a botched mortar strike called in by Lieutenant Wolf, which itself eliminates at least four more characters, and gets most of the platoon back to the LZ for exfiltration. 
It's also where we see that Elias, again, is not a perfect character or a perfect military leader. He tear asses off by himself on a one-man mission rather than leading his men. However, this is also where Barnes catches up with and shoots Elias. A blatantly homicidal fratricide that, again, shows this to be an awful platoon with way more than its historical average share of problems. Back at base camp, Barnes doubles down on his loathsome qualities when he confronts his men in the platoon in a drunken stupor, berates fallen comrades, and dares his own men to kill him, then almost kills one of his own men when Taylor is finally goaded into an attack. Again, atrocious leadership, especially given the platoon leader's role of protecting his men from the bad leadership of a tactically inexperienced platoon leader. Finally, with the platoon now at the breaking point, the stage is set for the final battle scene. Rival company is Hilo lifted into a, quote, battalion perimeter 2,000 meters from Cambodia, where they will be the target of an all-out enemy assault. There are a few big historical hang-ups here, especially if one considers this to be the, quote, dramatization of the Battle of Soi Cut. The battle was more like seven miles from Cambodia, contained two battalions instead of one, and no way can that still be the night of January 1st in the film. This is also where Taylor's voiceover mentions, quote, somewhere out there was the entire 141st NVA regiment. Well, Charlie Sheen, I'm afraid I got some bad news for you. The 141st NVA regiment was in fact hundreds of miles north where it would be destroyed by 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines about a month from now. There's a whole book by Terry A. Williamson just on this topic for anyone who's interested. Furthermore, Soy Cut features 271st and 277th NLF regiments, main force Viet Cong 9th Division, not the NVA at all. But again, it's just a dramatization. We have a fast shot at a battalion orders group featuring Dale Dye, who's been playing Bravo Company Commander Wolf's boss, Captain Harris. There are other officers here, assumedly Alpha and Charlie Company Commanders, along with a cameo by Oliver Stone himself, who of course has cast himself as the battalion commander. Dale Dye, himself a decorated Marine veteran of the Vietnam War, was the film's technical advisor, and his character, Captain Harris, is probably the only good leader we see in this movie. It's just a shame he didn't have a better handle on his platoon leaders. Speaking of which, in case we had any doubts about Wolf's cartoonishly bad leadership qualities, we have the scene where Ramucci is tasked with taking over what's left of Elias' squad. Ramucci laments that his squad, quote, is down to half strength, and Wolf's guidance on this issue is, quote, I really don't give a shit. I just don't give a flying f anymore. Okay, moments like this are why some veterans, and even some Vietnam veterans, really have a problem with this movie. Look, we've all served under some bad officers from time to time, but this doesn't happen. And if it does, you can bet your ass he's not wearing those bars tomorrow. Were there bad officers in Vietnam? Of course. But drop the idea that this is the definitive portrait of the American experience in Vietnam. This was your experience if you served in the worst platoon in the history of the United States Army, and it gets this bad because of this clown right here. At least in the military, virtually all problems begin and end at the top. Need more proof? We cut to another scene with the other man at the head of a sad circus, Staff Sergeant Barnes, who's now threatening torture and slinging overt racism at yet another one of his soldiers. Granted, this man has committed self-inflicted injury in an attempt to avoid combat, but that's more of an indication of the abysmal morale of the platoon, blame for which can be laid squarely at the feet of the men in charge, again, Barnes and Wolf. Night falls, and at last the battle begins in earnest. We have Ramucci warning his men to stay in their fighting holes because the Air Force is going to be dropping, quote, Snake and Nape, which is slang for an ordnance mix of 500-pound bombs with specially fitted drag fins for low-altitude strikes, called the Mark 82 Snake Eye and Napalm, hence the expression. The enemy attack comes in, and again, it's clearly NVA instead of the historical Viet Cong. Although horrible, this was exactly the kind of battle the U.S. Army wanted in Vietnam, where the enemy came up out of the jungle and hit them, not vice versa. Note that this is the only time in the movie the communists are up and running at the Americans, not vice versa. Such engagements were rare, and when they did come, things get bloody very, very fast. Speaking of bloody, we very quickly lose most of the rest of our cast members here. These men are exhausted, demoralized, they panic, and they make bad mistakes, and they pay the final price very quickly. Oliver Stone has himself blown up along with the whole battalion CP by a suicide bomber, and our movie platoon is more or less wiped out. The company commander, Captain Harris, calls in an airstrike basically on himself, 
which is delivered by a pair of what looks like F-5 Freedom Fighters. A desperate command that seems to finally win the battle. Morning breaks over a devastated landscape. The firebase has held, but the platoon has basically ceased to exist. Captain Harris may be the only officer left in the battalion, never mind the company. Confirmed unwounded survivors from the movie platoon are Sergeant O'Neill and Marucci. That's about it. Francis is okay until he commits a self-inflicted wound to escape further combat. And as for our main character, Taylor, and our main villain, Barnes, well, hey, what's one more case of blatant, intentional fratricide? This script seems to take every bad thing that happened with the U.S. Army in Vietnam and mash it into one unfortunate platoon of eight balls, drug addicts, murderers, malingerers, and cowards, all under some of the worst leaders in U.S. military history. Again, did all these things happen in Vietnam? Yes. Did they all happen to the same unit, and were they that typical? No. I do like the use of M113 APCs at the end of the movie. Uh, two of the companies at Soy Cut were mechanized infantry with these vehicles, so their inclusion here, even if the movie isn't trying to say this is really Soy Cut, really does make sense. I'm just not sure about the Third Reich battle ensigns flying from the radio antenna. Seriously, who is in charge of this unit? So that's going to wrap up our military historical review of Platoon. I give it a solid 8 out of 10, strictly in terms of historical accuracy, which again, doesn't seem to be the primary objective of the movie, to be fair. The dates and units don't really line up. It concentrates way too many of the problems faced by 2.7 million servicemen who served across Vietnam into a single luckless platoon of like 30 guys. And I didn't touch too heavily on this, but in passing, let me just say, but the way it portrays African-American soldiers leaves a little to be desired, especially near the end of the film. So I hope you enjoyed this military, historical, and war gamers look at Platoon. If you do, please make sure to hit the like button. This helps YouTube know that our content is appreciated by you, the community, and helps our channel grow. For now, this is a Risky Jim for the Sip Rep Podcast, and as always, Tango Mike for listening.